My friend's been charging his Tesla with a level one charger and he is ready for an upgrade. Today, we're gonna to do a full install of the Emporia level two charger. And this charger is special. It has load management control. And that's important if you have a panel that cannot manage the total load that this can put out at any given time. None of the materials in today's video were sponsored. All of the materials were purchased at retail pricing. We are using an Emporia View, which I have used in the past. And the reason we're using the Emporia View is because it has a load management system. My friend has a 90 amp sub panel in his garage, but there are a lot of circuits in the sub panel. He has a refrigerator, lights, bathrooms, a dryer, washing machine, all kinds of extra circuits on this. And if we were to run the full 48 amps for the charger and the dryer and these other circuits, it would overload the system. But with the Emporia, we can put sensors on the main lines, and if there's already heavy loads on the panel, it'll throttle back the car charging so that we don't overload the circuit. This is a really great system when you have a situation like this. So today, we're gonna to go over all the details of how to install this step-by-step. Step. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. Let's get started. I'm not an electrician. If you don't have experience with electrical wiring, you should get an electrician to do this work for you. If you are doing work on your own home in the U.S., in most places, you can do that as long as you're getting it inspected. So if you have any questions, you can talk to your local inspector. Before we get started working on the electrical side, you want to make sure and do some simple things like remove any jewelry you have, my wedding ring in this case. And it helps to have some rubber lined gloves just for some extra protection. Be sure and shut off any breakers leading to the panels that you'll be working in. For convenience, we wanna use this sub panel, but it's almost full. So to make a little bit of extra space, we're gonna take some of these individual breakers and replace them with dual output breakers. And that will allow us to condense some of these circuits and give us space to put in our double 60 amp breaker for the charger. In addition to that, I'm going to add a 20 amp breaker for an additional outlet on the other side of the building. We'll need to make quite a bit of space in this panel, so I have several of these double breakers to do that. Once you've turned the breaker off, make sure you confirm with a meter that it's actually off. Connect to the main lugs coming into the panel. Make sure it says zero volts, and we're good to go. With everything powered down, I'm going to combine some of these circuits. I'm gonna combine all four of these into two of these, and that'll leave me two open slots for a 60 amp breaker for the charger. And I would prefer that they be at the top. That's where the input is, and that way there's less bus bar for the load to travel through. One thing I have to be sure to do is make sure it's the same rating. So these are 15 amp breakers. I'm gonna be putting in 15 amp breakers. There are a lot of breakers that are considered compatible between different load centers, but technically you should use the breaker that matches the brand of your load center and all of your breakers should be the same brand. Wiggle your wires around a little bit, then make sure they are torqued down to the specified torque. Now I have a space for my 60 amp breaker. There we go, was that easy? Make some space for it. Just use these doubled up breakers. Now I've got space for my 60 amp breaker. I picked a medium height spot on the wall here so we'll have plenty of space to coil underneath. And then I put the whole thing a little bit lower so that we can put an outlet above it. I just took the mounting bracket off of the unit, leveled it up on the wall. Now I'm just gonna put some anchors in the wall for that. I just ordered these metal anchors off of Amazon. They're pretty easy to get. With the bracket on the wall, it's super easy to just hang the unit and tighten a couple of screws on the sides and the bottom. I coiled the charging cable to find a comfortable place for the hanger and secured it with a couple of drywall anchors. Now I have the Emporia mounted exactly where we want it. To bring the power from our sub panel, I'm going to use this very simple junction box, which I'm going to mount just above the unit. And then we can pull power right to the junction box. That'll give us easy access to make any modifications we want to and we can make very high confident connections in that using Polaris lugs. So I'll just mount that in a position that the whip reaches, and then I'm going to also add an outlet for later use. All right, I made a short run for my uh, outlet, and that will go right up into the box. I'm gonna mount it here above the Emporia, just so we'll have an extra 120 volt outlet available. This panel is embedded in the wall, so we can't just come right off the side. I'm going to come off the top since we don't have any main wires coming in here. There is spray foam in the walls. We'll cut a hole in the drywall. I'll use a flex fitting to come in the top of this, and that'll bring us to the outside of the wall. Then we'll run on the outside of the wall, up into the ceiling, and over to the end of the garage where we want to put the charger. All right, get that fed in there. 
It's a little bit, a little bit tight. To come up into the attic, I'm going to start from the attic. So I make sure I miss all the exterior sheathing. I'm just going to dig a hole down into the insulation and poke through right above the power panel. Since the sub panel is inset in the drywall, the section of one inch flex works perfectly for popping out of the drywall and makes routing up out of the box easy. You could also bend some conduit if you prefer. Popping up into the attic is a convenient and clean way to route the conduit towards the other end of the garage, but because there's a living space above the garage, we couldn't do it the whole way. So I used a 90 degree elbow up into the attic, a 90 degree elbow to drop back out of the attic, then a 90 degree access body to transition to the ceiling of the garage and aid in pulling the conductors. Now I have a one inch conduit routed from the sub panel at one end of the garage to the junction box all the way at the other side. I made a little jumper so I can ground my bus bar and the box together. So I'll go ahead and install that with a green ground screw to the grounding lug in the box. Here's a quick trick I learned on YouTube to make it really easy to pull the wire. So we'll put the vacuum on this end. And then over here, we'll suck it up. All right, so sucked it up there. All the way through the conduit, through the junction box, through the attic, down the wall, and out the other end. I'll use the kite string to pull some nylon rope through since we will need a lot of force to pull the large bundle of conductors. So I'll run two four gauge conductors, line one, line two, one six gauge for the ground. And then in order to power this outlet, we're gonna run an entire additional circuit. For that circuit, I have a line one and neutral. And then we'll take the ground off the ground bus from our junction box for that outlet. And that'll be a GFCI because it's in the garage. All of this is THHN. We'll tie it to our rope and get it pulled through. All right, I have connected my rope to all my conductors with a substantial amount of tape because I don't like to do it multiple times when I lose it halfway through the conduit. And then I have some lubricant that I will apply to it. Uh, I've gotten stuck before not using lubricant, so now I always use it. A lot of people will run six gauge for this. We're gonna run four gauge. It's a long run and you use a lot of power when you charge a car. Really high loads for really long periods of time. So over time, that resistance is going to consume some power. I didn't run the calculations to see how long it would take to pay off the cost of using four gauge instead of six gauge, but it'll run cooler, safer, and in the long run, it should be cheaper. I'm adding a ground wire for the outlet, then connecting it and the six gauge ground from the sub panel to the ground bus. Using a torque screwdriver is helpful to make sure everything is tightened sufficiently. There's no junction for the 12 gauge conductors. They'll just pass straight through the junction box to the outlet below. The four gauge wire is all black and I identified line one with some tape just for reference. I'm using Polaris lugs to make the connection between the four gauge run from the sub panel and the line one and line two connections from the Emporia. All right, there we go. Our junction box is all wired and, you know, if I had it to do again, I think I would have used a little bigger box. While this one is acceptable, it's, it's a bit tight. All right, everything's wired. Now we can put the cover on. Nice. All right, let's do the outlet. The ground, which I'm using 10 gauge because I had that handy, but it is a stranded wire and the neutral is also stranded, so I'm using ferrules on those in order to make sure that we have the proper connection. On a GFCI, there is a load and a line side. And since we don't have a load, we're only doing line, I'll connect to the line side of the outlet. And as long as the screws are aligned vertically, you know it's done correctly. All right, I have my main conductors. I'm gonna to connect to my 60 amp breaker and my ground to the ground bus, and then this is my other circuit. We'll start with the ground. I always start with the ground connection. I have backed out my screw. Now I'll start just by tightening these with a regular screwdriver, but then I'm gonna come back and check them all with the Torx screwdriver 
at the end to make sure that I've gotten them all tight enough. Loose screws means high resistance and that will result in a lot of heat and can cause a fire. You have to make sure that all of your lugs are properly torqued. And it's typically a lot tighter than you would think. Now with the ground connected, I can go ahead and bring in these four gauge wires to my 60 amp breaker. And it always says right on the breaker exactly what the torque requirement is. Oh yeah. So now I have my ground, my line one, line two, and I'm gonna go ahead and connect the neutral and the hot wire for our extra outlet. A lot of circuits on this bus bar. All right, I confirmed the torque of all of our connections. Now the really cool thing about the Emporia charger is it can sense the amount of power coming into this panel from the main breaker and throttle the car charging so that it doesn't trip the main breaker. And since we have all kinds of circuits in here, some of which are high power devices such as a dryer, we wouldn't want to be charging the car at full power and have someone turn the dryer on and overload the entire panel and then everything in this panel would turn off. So that's one of the key advantage. That's why we're using the Emporia for this. In order to make that work, it has these CT sensors and it has an arrow on it for which direction the breaker is. In this case, the breaker is coming from another room. So we'll put it on this with the arrow pointing towards the exit. And we need one on the line one and one on line two because you could overload either one. To power the monitor, we have uh, wire harness here, and if you just install the app, it tells you exactly what to do. In this case, we're going to connect the white to the neutral bus. We will connect red to line one and black to line two, and the blue will also connect to neutral because we don't have a line three. All right, then for line one and line two, we're going to just split the power coming into this breaker. We'll pick two 15 amp breakers. They have to be right next to each other so you get line in one and line two. Okay, and then we'll Use the pigtail now to connect into the breaker and that will provide power for one line. If you had space in your panel, another option would be just to install a dedicated breaker for the Emporia. I like to use some zip ties to kind of keep the wiring neat. All right, I turned on the two breakers that are powering the Emporia. So it's powered up. All the connections are wired, the sensors are on. I can go ahead and put the panel back on. Everything in here is finished. Well, we can always take it back off. We followed the simple step-by-step -step instructions for installing the load sensor. Now, from the energy monitor menu, I just add an EV charger. In this case, we're using a charger with PowerSmart. We have already installed the charger, so I can go directly to setup. I simply select the broadcasting device, it quickly connects, and I can input the home Wi-Fi name and password. It takes a few seconds to connect to the cloud. Then I can name the charger 
and add the primary vehicle that will be charging at the station, in this case a 2023 Model Y. Now we can set the charging limits. We have a direct wire setup with a 60 amp breaker. Then we're linking to the energy monitor installed in the sub panel. And here it's called garage sub. We know the panel has a limit of 90 amps, so we can just enter that here. Now the charger will never use more than 48 amps and it will reduce that load if necessary to make sure the sub panel stays within the 90 amp service rating. With the settings complete, it takes a few minutes to update the firmware, then we'll be ready to charge and use the monitoring app to track the sub-panel loads. All right, now that we have upgraded the firmware and made all the settings, it's time to try it out. This is the true test. As soon as I plug in the charging cord, the vehicle connects and begins charging. It takes a few seconds to ramp up to the max rate of 11 kilowatts and 48 amps. So the car is charging at 48 amps and on the app we can see we're pulling 11,000 watts. Because there's no other big loads right now, the Emporia is able to use the entire capacity to charge the car. From the app we can see it's holding a full 11 kilowatts continuously with no issues. And he'll be able to track his power consumption over time to see what it actually costs to drive an electric vehicle. All right, fantastic. The car is charging, everything is working perfectly. Everything worked the first time. I really like it when things work the first time. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one on whether or not electric vehicles make sense for you. It has a free calculator that allows you to calculate the cost of driving a gas car versus an electric car. You can also check out all kinds of other projects, including ones on how to power your house with solar at my website, projectswithdave.com. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.